Well, welcome everyone. We ask that you come on in and have a seat. I know we got you on the bus for 45 minutes sitting down. The first thing you're going to do is sit down and begin. So, Dave, I think we have a several at the restroom. So welcome to Bean Reactor. My name is Terry Griffin. I'm one of the docents, much like Dave, who was with you on the way out. We're going to be sharing time together this morning. A little background on who I am. Uh, this is what a mostly retired Hanford worker looks like. I'm not quite old enough to have worked here, but I, uh, I have a degree in physics and math from the United States Naval Academy. Served on submarines, came here in 1980, and this is the only civilian job I ever had, was working in Hanford. Kind of worked all over, um, and reactors was one of my specialties. Mm -hmm. So this is an awesome experience for us to share today. So what I'm going to do is, we have a number of folks in the, in the restroom, so I'm going to run the video now, and then I'll, after they all get in here, and the video is over, I'll explain how we're going to spend our time here at B Reactor this morning. So with that, I'm going to show you a video that, be, that gives you a, uh, some background on how the reactor is constructed, how it works, and then we'll fill in some details after the video. You are standing in front of the core of the B Reactor. This is the heart of the operation, where a chain reaction transforms uranium into plutonium. Construction of the core of the reactor was an incredible undertaking. Tens of thousands of pieces had to be fit together to exacting specifications to make sure that the reactor would run smoothly. The reactor core front face has 2,004 process tubes. Inside the process tube, you'll find fuel elements. Those fuel elements are natural uranium or slightly enriched. They are each one and a half inches in diameter by 8.7 inches long. That's a standard fuel element. There are 32 of those per process tube. There are 16 spacers on the front that are basically just aluminum spacers. To keep the rate of reaction under control, the process tubes were encased in a 36 by 29 foot lattice of graphite, standing on a 28 foot thick concrete base. Compounding the difficulty was the fact that each block of graphite had to be individually drilled and then stacked by hand with very little tolerance for error. In addition to the holes for the 2004 process tubes, the graphite also had to have space for 29 vertical safety rods, nine horizontal control rods, and a cooling system. So we have a basically inner core of 75,000 blocks with holes bored in every direction you can think of, top, bottom, side, left, and front and back. What were they using? Bricklayers is what did it. They put chalk strings across, they laid them in, they stacked them. This inner core is surrounded by a wall of cast iron blocks as a safety or thermal shield. These blocks absorb 97% of the gamma radiation emitted from the core. In addition, there is a biological shield that is outside of the core to protect workers in the area. Well, there's 52 inches of laminated steel and masonite then on the outside of that, there's a one inch thick boilerplate that encloses the whole thing, makes it gas tight. Intense heat is generated inside the core when nuclear reactions take place. To make sure that the heat did not destroy the reactor, a complex cooling system was developed. The large vertical tubes you see on either side of the reactor face carried cooling water to the spiral pigtails, which lead into the reactor core. That water is basically comes out of the Columbia River and then pumped to the 190. The 190 is the pressure pumping. That water then comes out of the 190, feeds up to the headers, through the cross headers, which are 42 of them, through the pigtail nozzles, and into each process tube. Basically, the flow splits the 27,000 gallons per minute, and each provides to the core area, which is the hottest area, a higher flow than in the perimeters around the outside because they don't produce as much heat. The water that flows through there takes about a second from the time it enters the process tube until it's discharged out the back. 
With precise construction and imaginative design, the reactor core you see before you was truly a marvel of engineering. And, and that's one of the key messages we really try to convey on this tour, is what an incredible achievement this was. To, to kind of frame that up, the science that went into this was about two years old when they began construction. So that's pretty astounding. And then to recognize that this facility, two others like it, and three chemical processing facilities, and all the infrastructure associated with that was built in about 15 months. Further just is an amazing part of that. Now, so with that kind of said, here's what we're going to be doing today. You're here for a tour. Now, this was a tour that was advertised as a technical tour, right? So how many people signed up because it was technical? Right, so these are the folks that we will try to fill, and the rest of you, we're not going to leave you behind. All right, I'm going to thread the needle on that. So that's what we're going to do. Now, as we're here, I'm going to spend about 20 minutes, and I'm going to explain the the how, the what, and the why of B reactor. And when we get done, you're all going to be nuclear physicists of the vintage of 1944, and no one will be entered in that process. All right, so that's what we're going to do. Now, at the end of this period. You've gotten maps that we've handed out, and you're going to have some free time to walk around, take as many pictures as you want. Then you're going to hear a PA announcement that says, go to one of two locations, and I'll describe those at the end. And Dave and I will be at each one of those locations and give a presentation. We're going to do that twice, because after another 30 minutes, you'll go to the place you weren't. You'll hear that other presentation. And Dave and I have been specially trained to give those presentations word for word identically so that neither group gets special treatment all right everybody good with that so that's what we're going to do all right so at the beginning here first thing that we really need to understand is why in the world did, did we build this thing and the short answer is we wanted to make plutonium now, there's a longer answer on how in the world does that work this is where i'm going to thread the needle between that technical and those of you that just want to know some stuff so, I was a Navy guy, I've confessed that already, so I'm going to share about nuclear fission the way that they taught sailors. And if sailors can understand it, everyone can. All right? So how many people have ever broken a cookie? All right, everybody's done that. You typically have done that because you're going to share it. And what you probably know, if you break that cookie, you're not going to get two equal sized pieces. They'll be close, depending on how careful you are, but they're not going to be equal sized. So if you're benevolent, you give the bigger one away. But you know that's the case. But what you may not know is if you put 10 cookies on a table and attempt to break them equally, when you get done breaking those 10 cookies and you step back, you're going to notice that the pairs aren't the same either. Well, the exact same ha thing happens with fission. When we split the uranium atom, we'll generally get two pieces, but sometimes when you break a cookie, you get three or more. Same thing happens there. But what happens when that uranium atom splits, every time we do that to the next uranium atom, we'll get different sized pieces each time. And effectively, we'll produce everything known to man in this reactor. And those fission products that we create when we split the uranium atom, they're radioactive. Hold that thought, because that's going to be important here in a minute. So what does it mean to split the atom? So everybody's probably familiar with the solar system and recognize that we got the sun in the middle and the planets in orbit around it. So back in the 30s, a guy named Niels Bohr came up with what, with what he called the Bohr model for the atom. What he said was in the middle of the atom, which we're going to call the nucleus, there were two kinds of particles, protons that have a positive charge and neutrons that have no charge. They're all smashed together in the middle, and then around that are the electrons. And they're orbiting around much like our, our planets. Now the reason that's important is scientists started thinking about that. And they said, wait a minute, we've got all these positive charged particles that are all smashed together in the middle of the nucleus. Well, like charges want to repel each other. They want to push each other apart. So there must be some incredibly strong force that's holding those things together. Now we scientists are very proud of our creativity, especially the things that we name things. All right, so they call this force, this incredibly strong force holding the protons together, the strong force. See how easy it is to be a physicist. All right. So what they also figured out was if they could split that thing into a couple of smaller pieces, that it wouldn't take as much of that strong force to hold them together, and they'd get some energy out of it. And that was the whole motivation that people went out to try to split the atom in the first place. All right. Now, the other thing that happens when you break a cookie is what? 
You get crumbs out of it, right? Well, the same thing happens when we split the uranium nucleus. When it splits, we get some neutrons that come out of it, just like the crumbs from a cookie. Now, sometimes you get two neutrons, sometimes three. In a reactor like this, it's about 2.43 on average. Now, the reason that's important is if it takes one neutron to start the chain reaction of splitting the atom, and we get 2.43 neutrons every time we do it, we've got extra neutrons. And we, that's either an opportunity or it's a curse. What we're going to do is turn that into an opportunity in this reactor. All right? So here's, here's how that works. Enrico Fermi, in 1942, set out and achieved a self-sustaining, controlled nuclear reaction. He did that at the University of Chicago in a squash court underneath the football stadium at the University of Chicago. It wasn't your typical laboratory. Now the reason he did that is he found that fission, those neutrons that come off the fission event are moving so fast that they're not that likely to cause the next fission unless you slow them down. So what he came up with is he was going to use graphite, which is essentially just pure carbon, because graphite will slow neutrons down and not absorb them. So he built this machine, it was a pile of graphite with uranium in it, and he came up with a creative name of nuclear pile. You see? Everybody's tracking with this, right? So he had this graphite, and I'm sure they didn't assign him a regular laboratory, because when you stack graphite, you get all that you know, dust around, and it was a kind of a messy place. All right, so he, had, he demonstrated that he could control this reaction. Now, about the same time, there were two scientists, a guy named Glenn Seaboard and Edwin McMillan. And they were at the University of California at Berkeley and they were bombarding uranium with neutrons. Now why do guys do that? I don't know, because they're curious and they're scary smart, right? So these guys were doing that and what they came up with is after they bombarded that uranium for a while, when they put their big gamma detector next to it, they saw two new gammas they had never seen before. So for this group here, when radioactive decay occurs, we get a characteristic gamma. It's like a fingerprint. And for plutonium, that fingerprint is 414 kiloelectron volts. Everybody's excited about that, right? So what they saw was this 414, and they said, gee, that's not something we've seen before. So when they did chemical separation, they determined they had created two new elements heavier than they ever had seen before. Now, why is that important? Well, because the heaviest one, which they call plutonium, behaves just like uranium, absorbs neutrons and fissions. And so they found that they could make something just like uranium, produce it, and they would have feed either for reactors or nuclear weapons. Now let's put those two facts together. Now I am indebted to my, my partner here, Dave, for this visual aid. I love this so much, and this is the first time that I've been able to share this with Dave here and give him the, uh, the props for what he's done. When we dig uranium out of the ground, there's two kinds of uranium. They have the same number of protons, different number of neutrons. There's uranium-235 and uranium-238. Now, uranium-235 is what splits, does that fissioning thing, giving us the extra neutrons, but there's a very small amount of that. So Dave came up with this visual because when I tell you that there's 0.707% uranium-235 in nature, you're kind of going, well, that seems small, but what does that look like? Well, it looks like this. Uranium-235 are the blue balls. Dave tells us there's a thousand balls in here. There are seven blue ones. Okay, that represents the uranium-235. That's what it's going to fission. The others are uranium-238. That's what Seaborg and McMillan discovered. That absorbs a neutron, decays twice, and becomes plutonium-239. So this, the whole purpose of this reactor at the end of this long answer to why did we build it, is we want to split the blue ones, get those extra neutrons, absorb them in the silver ones, and make plutonium. And if you track that, you are a nuclear physicist of the vintage of 1943. All right, so now that we've done that, we've got the physics all understand, it's easier from here because now it's engineering. How many scientists versus engineers in the group? All right, well, let's move on. So what they needed to do was to design something that they could put fuel in, run it long enough to make that plutonium, and then get it out and put new fuel in. They needed to build a system like that. So what they did was, a little differently than, than uh, Fermi's reactor, they made their pile 
out of graphite that was drilled to accept a process tube. So if you look over to your right, you'll see examples of the actual physical size of the graphite blocks that are in here. Now when the video said that there are 75,000 blocks, well that's a small sample of the 75,000 that are in here. Now notice this segment that I have has a hole drilled in it. That's to accept the process tube that we're going to stick our fuel in. Now this is a piece of a process tube. If you want to see a full one, if you look up and to your left, you'll see hanging there from the ceiling aluminum process tubes. Now as you look at the reactor, you can see how wide and tall it is. If you look at those tubes, you now know how deep it is. It is a huge structure. And those process tubes fit in the graphite blocks and they provide a place for us to put our fuel. Now the fuel looks like this. So it's an eight inch long cylinder, about an inch and a half in diameter. And inside of this, this is not an actual, it's an actual size, but not a real uranium slug. But it's coated with aluminum. The reason for that is uranium metal is pyrophoric, which means it spontaneously bursts into flame and air. So the ready answer to that is keep the air off of it, so the aluminum takes care of that. The other reason they clad it with aluminum is we're going to split those atoms inside, we're going to make radioactive material. And we're going to flow cooling water over this thing to keep it cool, and we don't want the radioactive material in the water, so the aluminum takes care of that as well. Now if you look at the process tube, it's a little difficult to see from the back, but there are two ribs on the bottom of the tube, so that when we put the fuel in there, it forms an annulus all the way around. Without those rails, the thing would be sitting on the bottom and a lot, a large section of the, of the fuel would not get cooling water flowing past it. So the DuPont company that was chosen to design and operate this reactor, they thought of things like this when they designed it. Now these process tubes, what you're seeing is the closure system for the process tube. So behind, behind each one of these nozzles, that's where our process tube makes up to, but you're seeing this here. And it has two entry points, one for water cooling flow, and one to be able to put fuel in. Now on the back of the process tube, on the back side of the reactor, it looks exactly the same. So when it comes time to replace the contents of the fuel in that process tube, take the tube, the, the nozzle off of both ends, the cap, we feed in from the front, the old material falls out the back. Did I say fall out? Yes, I did. And Dave will show you back in the control room when we get to that section, a good graphic of what that looks like in the fuel storage basin. So we'll cover that later. All right, so we've designed and built this thing. Now, how do we cool it? So Dave's gonna help me with that. So we have this model here because most of the equipment that's on this, on this map isn't here for us to show you, but Dave showed you some of it on the way in. He showed you the Columbia River and the pumping station, and you drove by the settling basin there. So those are still here because we're using that water elsewhere on site, but it's not servicing the water anymore. So from there, it went through a filter plant to remove the rest of the solids that didn't fall out in that retention basin. And then it came into the 190 pumping building where the pressure was raised to bring the water in under the floor, up through those cross headers into the 2004 process tubes. So it pumped it into the building that you are sitting in, the 105B building. And notice when the water leaves the reactor, we change the color because it's now extremely hot. And it goes out to a settling basin where it was allowed to thermally cool for a period of time before it was discharged back to the river. Thank you, Dave. I always pause right there and let people <coughs> contemplate. And they're thinking, wait a minute, you, well not you, but people like you, pumped water through a reactor and then sent it back to the river? Why was that okay? I don't know if it was okay because there were no regulations, but remember that aluminum cladding? The water's flowing outside, the radioactive material is inside, and as long as the aluminum is intact, there's no radioactive material getting into the water. So it looks good on paper, but we wouldn't run a reactor like that today. The reason is because we want the heat. When that fissioning occurs, it's putting out a great deal of energy, and we want to harvest that. So today, we take the water, and we don't dump it back to wherever we got it from. We recirculate it, we remove the heat, and make
take steam and turn a turbine and make electrical power. But here, this was a pioneering effort. They wanted neutrons to make plutonium. The heat was a byproduct, and that's how we dealt with it. Now, the other thing I always try to mention is today, you know, to, to look at today, what is the consequence of having run this this way? Well, all that heat is long gone. But we put a corrosion inhibiting chemical in the water called sodium dichromate. About two parts per million was what it went through there. It was a corrosion inhibitor. And when you dissolve sodium dichromate in water, what you get is hexavalent chromium, which is the era Aaron Brockovich chemical, if you're familiar with that. It's highly toxic. So at those low levels, it wasn't significant unless concentrated. We're still cleaning up in the groundwater here along the river sodium dichromate. So that was the major environmental impact of operating the reactor. All right, so we've done the physics, we've constructed the reactor, we've cooled it. One more thing we need to do is to shield and control it. So this is how that's done. This is a one-tenth scale model of the reactor I'm gonna to use to illustrate those two things. So if you imagine the large graphite pieces that I've shown you over on your right, this model is a one-tenth scale of the reactor itself, and it's a cutaway so I can show you what's inside. So in the very middle is where the graphite is, and the process tubes you can see running through that, but there's a shielding assembly outside, because we can't recognize that all that radioactive material that's gonna be built in this fuel, they needed to shield their workers from that. So they put a, some cast iron blocks around the outside, and what that did was reduce the gamma radiation by 97%. Now that sounds great, doesn't it? 3% isn't a lot, except 3% of a big number is still a big number. So they wanted to take care of that. And the cast iron doesn't do anything for the neutrons that are leaking out of the reactor. So they surrounded that shield assembly with a shielding assembly called the biological shield made up of masonite and steel. Now masonite is what we used to make clipboards out of. Now, they didn't choose masonite because they had a bunch of clipboards laying around. They chose it because it's rich in hydrogen. And as the neutron hits that hydrogen, it slows down so that the steel can stop it. That's the principle of that shielding. So now that shielding was efficient enough, I could be standing where I am right now with the reactor at full power and not receive any appreciable radiation dose. So that was an incredibly good shield that they had put together to operate. Now as a result of that shield, they, they have a problem. We want our fuel to be located in the graphite region, but we have this section of process tube that we don't want it in. And that's where the spacers come in. So what they did was they loaded each process tube with 32 fuel assemblies, 16 spacers on the rear, and 16 in the front so that the fuel was centered in the graphite. That was the purpose of the spacer. And that's why that was done that way. One last thing then to cover is we have these extra neutrons. Now, not all of them are going to leak or be absorbed in uranium-238. And if we don't do something to take care of those extra neutrons, the reactor power is just going to increase and the reactor is going to destroy itself. So what they came up with was, was Fermi who discovered that 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 graphite is going to slow neutrons down but not absorb them. But he also dis discovered elements like cadmium and boron that will absorb a neutron. So what he did was, in Fermi's case he used cadmium, what they used here in the B reactor was boron. They put it in these rod-shaped elements so that they could use that to control the neutron reaction. Again, a very creative name, these are called control rods. See how easy it is. Now there are 29 of these vertical safety rods and nine horizontals. The vertical rods, just like their name suggests, are withdrawn vertically out of the reactor. And what they do is they're, they're gonna be fully withdrawn so that they're ready to drop if anything happens to shut the reactor down. But with all 29 withdrawn, the reactor is not quite self-sustaining. So these extra nine horizontal control rods, which move out of the reactor in this fashion, there are nine of those. They're used to then control the reactor power. Now, if you look at the vertical safety rod, you'll notice it doesn't look very straight. The reason for that is there's a knuckle joint about every two feet. So again, this was something that DuPont came up with. As we've stacked up all this graphite, it's got a hole drilled through all of those in a vertical fashion for that 
that to go. But what if that shifts a little bit? A, a rigid rod wouldn't necessarily be able to get down through that hole. So what they did was they knuckled that rod so it would shimmy its way down the hole if it was misaligned. So they thought about a lot of those kind of safety considerations. Now in the control room, they will talk about a third way of shutting down the reactor called the 3X ball system. So I'm going to save that for his time. So one last thing then to cover is what are we going to do for the rest of our time together? Because I've talked really fast, I've used the time allotted, and I've shared with you everything I intended to share. I'll ask for questions in just one minute. But here's what's going to happen next. We're going to disperse you. You've got your mats, and in about 30 minutes you're going to hear an announcement that says, go either to the control room, which is number 13 on your map, or number 7 on your map. And number, or number 13, which is the valve pit, or I may have gotten those reversed. The valve pit is right back here. Now what I'm going to suggest is, the first time the announcement is heard, you folks would go to the valve pit. And you folks would go to the control room. Then, after that 10 minute presentation at those two locations, you'll get to walk around some more. Then you'll hear another announcement, and it will tell you to go where you weren't the first time. Now if you forget what group you're in, here's what you do. Go someplace first, and go to the other place next. <laughs> See how easy this is? It's awesome, all right? With that, I've got time for a question or two. Otherwise, we're going to have you go off. Yes, sir? So it seems like, depending on where I was on the base, there could be a variation in terms of quality, or quality of yield coming out there. How would they track that? Excellent question. So the question is, how did they account for the fact that the production rate is different in each of those process tubes. It's higher in the middle than it is on the edge. So when you get to the control room, and if I talked up Dave's presentation to the control room enough, when you get to the control room, he's going to show you the instrumentation they use to measure the linear power in each tube. Knowing the linear power, I know what the production rate is in that tube, and then we determine based on time and power when each tube was ready to change. So the next logical question is how often did they do that? And so typically they'd run 30 to 40 days, shut down the reactor and replace the contents of 10 to 15% of the tubes and start over. So the batch process, right? Yeah. So the question is whether a batch process versus continuous. It was a batch process, exactly right. Any other questions? All right, with that, I'm gonna, yes sir. How in the heck did they do this all in two years? So it's a testimony to what people can do when they collaborate and, and, and work together. And so there was science and engineering coming together with a common purpose that they dedicated themselves to. It's incredible, absolutely. And that's why this is a National Historic Site and part of the National Park Service as well. So with that, I'm gonna have you all go you know, to the four winds. I will be here to answer any questions you want. They will be in the control room to do the same. When you hear the PA announcement, go to those places and we will see you. Enjoy your time at the reaction. Yes, sir. So the ventilation system down this corridor are our exhaust fans and down that corridor are the main supply fans for the building. Now what DuPont came up with is they recognized, you know, we're making this radioactive material in the reactor and they understood that if there was an upset condition, they didn't want that stuff getting down into the environment, they wanted it contained within the building. Now you can build an airtight building, but it's really difficult and it's even harder to keep it airtight as you, you know, come and go through the building. So what they came up with is what we call confinement. Now confinement 
is a system where we operate the building at a slightly lower pressure inside than outside. So then what happens is your tight building leaks inward as opposed to outward. And the way we achieve that is we run our supply fans at a slightly lower flow rate than we run the exhaust fans at. And as a result, the exhaust fans are trying to pull more air out of the building than we're putting in, and it's at a negative pressure. Okay, that's how confinement works. Now, the other principle that DuPont came up with is what we call today in the nuclear industry defense in depth, which means for a safety system, one way doesn't cut it, two is pretty good, but we're really much more happy with three ways of doing a safety function, all right? So that's called defense in depth. So that if something fails, you've got fallback positions. You've got a plan B and C. So it's easier to see down this hallway here when we get done. You can walk down there and you'll see four fans. So the first two have pipes running to them. The second two have wires running to them. And the reason is they operate on different power. So the first two are steam driven. The second two are electrical. Now the electricity for this area came from the, the Bonneville Power Grid, predominantly the Grand Coulee Dam, which had just been finished about that time, so there's an abundance of electrical power here. So that's how those, those the last two fans ran. The first two fans, the steam driven, they built a steam plant here at B Reactor. So if you look at our model, you'll see a steam plant. And it was coal fired, so they brought in coal, they burned the coal, boiled water, and they made steam. Now that building had its own little small electric turbine so it could run itself. So it didn't need power from offsite to run. So those fans were completely redundant in their ability to keep this building negative. Now I made a big deal about three ways and I've only explained two. So am I holding out or is there a third way? I would not hold out on you. In fact, you saw the third way when you pulled in. You just maybe didn't recognize it. Everybody see the tall stack behind the building? You might have wondered, what in the world they need a smokestack and a reactor for? It's not a smokestack. That's the building exhaust. All right? So these exhaust fans, after they pulled the air out of the building, it discharged below the floor, out through a plenum, through a filter system, and up the stack. Now the reason for the stack is we're going to exploit the natural effect called the chimney effect that's going to cause that airflow in this building to go up the stack even with no fans running. And if you walk down both of the passageways and listen real carefully, you won't hear a fan running. There aren't any. But if you draw in a deep breath and you ask yourself, is the air musty? The answer is no. And the reason is that stack is, is ventilating this building all day every day, keeping the air exchanged on a, on a small basis and keeping it that way. So that's how the, the ventilation system works. Now on the water cooling side, I think everybody recognizes, gosh, you know, you've got to flow water through the reactor to keep it cool. This reactor ran at 250 megawatts, 250 million watts of heat output. All right, so if you don't remove that heat, that's a problem. But what a lot of people don't know is even after you shut down, so we put the control rods in, we stop that nuclear reaction, it still is producing heat. And the reason for that is, that radioactive material that resulted from the fissioning process, as the radioactive decay occurs, that gives off heat. So check out this creative name. We call that decay heat. See, everybody can be a physicist. The mystery is gone. All right, now you might ask, well, how much, how much heat could that be? That's a great question. It's 6% of the reactor's full power. Now, 6% doesn't sound like much unless it's a pay raise. Then it's pretty astounding. But let's do a little math. When the reactor first started up, it ran at 250 megawatts. After World War II, when the Cold War broke out, they raised the power of this reactor from 250 to 2,000 megawatts, and they raised the flow from 27,000 to 60,000 gallons per minute. Now, I tell you that for two reasons. One, it's true, and two, I can do the math in my head. 6% of 2,000 is 120 megawatts. That's nearly half of what this reactor ran at initially. So I hope you understand that the KD is a significant problem that has to be dealt with after you shut a reactor down. In fact, every reactor accident you've ever heard about where fission products wound up in the environment, except for Chernobyl, was be not because they couldn't insert the control rods in a big hurry, it was because they couldn't keep water flow through the reactor for the days, weeks, and months 
necessary to remove that decay heat. So is everybody convinced that water cooling is important? Excellent. All right, so the 190 building was located behind these folks and to your left. It's on the map, but it's not here anymore. And in the 190 building, is we had two kinds of pumps, and you can probably guess what kind they were, right? Electric and steam driven. For the exact same reason we did it on our fans. We wanted that redundancy, that defense in depth. The other thing we did is down this hallway here, you'll see an air compressor between the two ventilation units. And there's a big wheel on the shaft that's called the flywheel. Now the reason for that is that in that case, the compressor, we don't want it to stop abruptly when it loses power. It'll coast down because we've stored energy in that rotating flywheel. So we put flywheels on the pumps in the 190 building for the exact same reason. Those vertical safety rods gotta travel 28 or so feet and it doesn't happen instantaneously. So as they're inserted in the reactor, the power coasts down as opposed to stop abruptly. So we put that feature on the pumps so they would do the same, all right? Now again, I've only explained two ways. There must be a third way to cool the reactor and there was. So using my water bottle as an example, You'll notice that on our model, next to the reactor were two tanks on stilts, all right? And the way they worked is that tank was connected, there's two of them, one was connected to this piping, and one was connected to the other piping that fed the two sides of the reactor. Now those two tanks totaled a half a million gallons of water. Now they were connected to the piping by way of a check valve, all right? Now a check valve is a, is a device that when one, of, one or more pumps were running, the check valve was closed, trapping the water in that, in that tank. But if both pumps were lost at the same time, the check valve automatically opened and water would flow by gravity through the reactor and cool it. Now the, when the flow stopped, the reactor automatically shut down. When you go to the control room, you'll see the circuitry that does that. But you're probably thinking, well, if you need it 50,000 gallons a minute, roughly, and there's 500,000 gallons, that's 10 minutes of water. You're telling me that's a safety system? But let's remember, you only need 6% of that flow to cool that decay heat. So now when you do the math, there's several hours of water trapped in those tanks. Now the question is, well, what happens if you run out of water? Well, you call the fire department, tell them to bring a pumper over. They put a suction hose in the river and a discharge hose to the tank and you can pump unclean water through the reactor and keep it cool. In fact, the fire department is part of emergency cool core cooling response for every commercial reactor in the United States for the exact same reason. Now, I made a big point then about all the cooling, the importance of cooling water, and now I'm showing you piping with a bunch of holes in it. And if the pumps are over there and the reactor's over here and the hole's in the middle, that's not gonna work very well. Well, that's exactly the point. It didn't look like that when the reactor was running. Those were all buttoned up tight and the water was gonna flow good. But in the late 80s, the Soviet Union and the United States agreed on two things. One, we had produced enough plutonium to destroy the Earth several times over and we didn't need to make any more. Now, plutonium does decay, but it takes 24,000 years for half of it to decay. So it's around for a long time. So we agreed we didn't need to make any more. And we also agreed we didn't trust each other to stop. All right? So we entered into a treaty and it had an inspection provision and the Soviets said, here's what I want to do. I want you to open up your water cooling system so you can't run the reactor. I'm going to take a picture of what that looks like and I'm going to come back in a year and I'm going to compare the picture I took to the what I got there and see it. And if it looks the same, I'm convinced you didn't run your reactor. Well, it's kind of hokey, but it does work. Now today, you can tell from space that we're not running the reactor because the 190 building isn't there. That's why we got the model out there to show you what it used to look like. But they still come here once a year to look at those. Now, the only explanation I have for that is the shopping is better here than where they're from. So with that, that concludes our time. Next announcement you hear, you'll go to the control room and hear that presentation there. I'll be out here to answer any questions that anyone has. Enjoy your time here at VREA. Yes, sir. We do. We're going to go this one. This is that person here. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm old. Quick yes, overview of how to run this thing. Pardon me? Quick overview of how to run it. Well, uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the, uh, those were used for the horizontal control rods, and they could select two through nine, 
Uh, sorry, three through nine. Oh, that's what those are for. Right. Mm -hmm. So you expect uh, which one you're moving and watch your power reactor. Exactly. Right. Yeah, and they would fine tune those. So yeah. this, we think of this as the gas pedal. So mm -hmm. this speeds up or slows down the reactivity. Right. Uh, safety rods are removed by that panel over the lower right. This guy. Uh, as I recall, yeah, the brass knobs, I think they're yeah. the ones inside the uh, plexiglass case on the lower right there. Uh, oh, they yeah. put a case over those because somebody kept bumping them and dropping the, the vertical safety rods in. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> yeah. This one, this black knob here, Your bolt trip drops the three X balls. Uh -huh. And that pretty much, that will shut the reactor down. Um, so basically it was removing the vertical safety rods yeah, and then fine-tuning the horizontal control rods. So these were like select your switch you could pick mm -hmm. which one you want to hold. Yep. Yep. You just want your specimen for the power. Uh, power was on this central panel, the galvanometer, that the top one would give you power level, the bottom would give you, actually I think that read out in terms of neutron flux, so the actual okay. neutron measurements that were taking place inside the reactor. Right. And there were, even though there were 2004 process tubes, there, the reactor was bored on the sides, top, bottom, every different configuration you can think mm -hmm. of. And there were monitors inserted mm -hmm. from the bottom, from the sides, and so forth. And there were test ports from the far side, the, uh, the opposite side of the reactor, uh, that you could put different types of material in and right. test what the reaction was going to be like um, inside the, uh, an operating reactor. Mm -hmm. These are... Um, uh, ion chambers that would use that they were used to measure the, the neutron activity in the reactor. All that information came back from the reactor. Say the zone temperature monitor that certain groups of tubing and stuff back there. Yes. So if you lost one of the flows, one of the tubes would trigger too, right? Okay. Originally it would, yeah. But then at, they figured out that the reactor operated a lot more safely and and stable than they thought it was going to. So they took the mercury switches off that was originally on the back of these catalytic gauges. So it took quite a bit to shut one down. Okay, um, presentation from the control room. Um, did you all get to hear Jerry's presentation in the valve bit? Yes. Okay. Um, so Jerry talked about water flow, uh, 30,000 gallons a minute. Originally, when the reactor was uh, designed for 250 megawatts, and then as the reactor power level was ramped up to 2,000 megawatts, we flowed 70,000 gallons of water through the reactor in a minute. Um, so at any one point in time, inside that 40 by 40 by 40 foot cube, we're about 400 gallons of water. Um, we come in from the river today probably around 60 degrees. One second would flow from front face to rear face, and it would increase in uh, temperature from 40, uh, 60 degrees up to about 195 degrees. They didn't want it to get any hotter than that because then it was a possibility that it would turn to steam, and if it turns to steam, you lose the ability to cool that reactor. So trying to keep the water below boiling uh, and below steam uh, transition. And uh, by three parameters, basically, uh, the temperature or the pressure of the water coming in the front side of the reactor, and that's what this panel did, would measure the pressure. Uh, those are called panel knit gauges, and this is an example of what one looks like. There's simply a pressure gauge that has a piece of quarter inch tubing that's connected to the back of each one of those and snakes its way through the reactor and attaches to the front of each one of those process tubes. And then on the rear, instead of a quarter inch copper tubing, there's an electric wire that attaches to this panel. So this panel measures the temperature of the water coming out the rear side of the reactor. So by measuring the pressure of the water coming in, the length of time that that fuel has been inside the core of the reactor, and the temperature of the water coming out the back of the reactor, the scientists can figure out <coughs> that batch has cooked, if you will, long enough. So normally, if you look at the white line that's on the bottom, center, and top uh, representation of the reactor, uh, anything inside that white line would be that hot spot that Jerry talked about. Uh, fuel would be in there for about 30 to maximum 45 days. Um, when they shut the reactor down, they take about 10 to 15 percent of the fuel out, insert new fuel, and then start the reactor back up. And it was a very quick process to do that. Um, they could do that within a 24-hour period very easily. <coughs> So, uh, uh, where was I headed? So those gauges measure the pressure. So it would be one operator that would be assigned to those panels on a day, on a shift. Um, and we would constantly take measurements on each one of the pressure uh, of each one of those 2004 process tubes. And then another individual would be over here monitoring the temperatures of the water coming out the backside. And then that would be fed into the physicist uh, to uh, determine how long that fuel needs to be in the reactor. The uh, warning up there, caution, bumping panel may cause scram. Mm -hmm. Scram is a term that stands for single or safety control rod axe man. 
and that comes from Burmese Chicago Pile One. Uh, he had a single vertical safety rod, if you will, poised over the top of the reactor that had a boron tip on it. So if that dropped into the reactor, it absorbed the neutrons and shut the reaction down. That was supported by a series of pulleys and a rope, and there was literally a guy standing there with an axe. So that's where the single control rod, axe man uh, uh, acronym comes from. His job was to cut that rope so it would drop that vertical safety rod into the reactor and shut the reactor down if it got out of control. So that term has been around since 1942 when mm -hmm. Fermi built the Chicago Pile 1. And it's used throughout the nuclear industry in the United States. The Navy uses it, the Air Force uses it, the, uh, all the military, the commercial nuclear power plants, Department of Energy, and commercial power plants use that uh, term to mean an emergency or, or um, a quick shutdown of a reactor. Um, let's see what else. Oh, uh, 3X balls. Uh, Jerry talked about the backup system if the vertical safety rods could not be inserted into the reactor. Uh, we had a system that came along in 1951 or 1952, as I recall. Uh, originally, there were uh, vats or tanks full of boric acid. And boron is that, that uh, neutron poison, the same that's in our vertical and horizontal safety rods. Uh, so if the, re the vertical safety rods could not be inserted into the reactor core, they would dump that vat of boric acid and it would filter down into the core of the reactor and absorb the neutrons and shut the reactor down. Um, if that happened, we, there's no way to get that boric acid back out of the core of the reactor, so the reactor essentially would be lost forever. You couldn't restart it. Um, so they came up with the system of, uh, of these 3X balls or boron impregnated stainless steel balls. And now at each one of those 29 vertical safety rods, there's a vat or a tank of these and if that uh, vertical safety rod will not insert, they open the valve and these uh, migrate down into the channels where those vertical safety rods would be uh, normally inserted. And it fills up the reactor with the 3X balls and then shuts the reactor down. And then these can be vacuumed back out of each one of those uh, uh, process tubes or, or vertical safety rod tubes and restart the reactor. It takes about two weeks to do that, so you don't want to um, uh, do that uh, unless it was really a, uh, an emergency shutdown. There's an interesting story that one of our docents uh, experienced when uh, early on in the tour program. Uh, she was talking about emergency shutdowns and backup systems and whatnot, and uh, Nancy mentioned that we have this 3X ball system. And the term, once those are discharged into the reactor, is dropping the balls. And so she, Nancy said, and so they, uh, at this particular instance, something happened, they dropped the balls. And there was a lady kind of standing back toward the back of the group, and she said, oh, my gosh. She said, 20-some years I've waited to understand what, that, what my husband meant. He came home one day, was just madder than a wet hen, slammed the doors, wouldn't talk to anybody, um, had to go work overtime. He was very upset. And she asked him what happened, and because of the security, he couldn't tell her that he, she was, he was working at a nuclear reactor. So he described the day, the activity of the day, as we dropped our balls today, and now we can go back to work in overtime. And she never knew what that, what that it meant. So after 20 years, finally, daylight was shed on her husband's story. Um, to, did I cover how many people it would take to operate? I think I did that previous. Okay. So to operate the reactor would be a minimum crew of about 15 people, 12 to 15 people. Um, one individual would be here in the senior reactor operator seat uh, 24 hours a day, whether the reactor was operating or not. And uh, uh, he would be supported by two other individuals, one that would be monitoring the pressure gauges and one that would be monitoring the temperature. Uh, there would be a shift supervisor somewhere in the building, uh, a radiation monitor who would be monitoring radiation levels in the building. A um, couple of other operators would be working the uh, front face activities and also the water flow and the ventilation systems that are over on the other side of the building. And uh, instrument tech, uh, probably an electrician and a couple of other craft individuals. So 12 to 15 people would be the minimum crew to operate the reactor during the day. If you remember back to that diorama where I showed the water flow, um, that would be uh, to operate all of the activities within uh, B area would be about 250 or 300 people during the day. There was a steam plant that operated to provide backup steam in case they lost the electricity. Um, there was uh, the water treatment facilities, the gas treatment facilities, and so forth. So about 250 people or so on a day shift. On graveyard and swing, that would be cut down to probably 30 or 40 people in all of uh, the area. So. What format did the final plutonium, plutonium come out as? 
uh, when it was finished, when they, when they had uh, completed the processes at the separations building, it was in a sludge format, um, about the consistency of peanut butter. Kind of a it was a nitrate, a plutonium nitrate solution. That would be shipped to uh, the 231Z building or the plutonium finishing plant, and then they would uh, center that, burn it in an oven, and that would turn it into a powder, and then that would be uh, further burned into a metal button. So the product that left here was a metal slug or a metal button, about the size of a hockey puck, about two and a half, three inches in diameter, and about an inch and a half high or so, and weighed about <coughs> five pounds. Something like that. And then that would be transported to Los Alamos and they would manufacture, fashion that into the weapons parts. So the original batch that went was hand carried by uh, Colonel Matthias in a suitcase on a train, from, went by car from here to Portland, then on a train from Portland to San Francisco. And when he got to San Francisco, he there was a young soldier there that met him that was supposed to help him get uh, the material to uh, Los Alamos. And he asked him if he had a secured uh, car, a berth. And the soldier said, no, it was really a busy train today. I couldn't get one. And Matthias said, do you know what I have or do you know what this material is worth? And he described that it was worth about $300 million. So the guy says, I'll go get a berth. So he went back, came back on a berth, and they actually transported to Los Alamos on the train in a secured berth. But by hand, uh, then the next batches went via convoy, either by rail or by um, truck. Yeah, pretty amazing. Questions? Other questions? What was the final date this operated? Uh, February 1968. I don't remember the exact date, but that's why that, that calendar is up there. Uh, seems like it was the 28th, but I don't remember that for sure. 27th or 28th of February 1968. So it shut down after World War II. Uh, I didn't think we needed any more plutonium, and then Cold War started back up very shortly after that. And they started back up three reactors and built an additional six during the Cold War era. Um, and then this one operated until 1968. And the clocks, you'll see some of the clocks are set at uh, 10, whatever, 10, 40, 47, 48. Uh, that was the 10, 48 p.m. was the time the reactor started up. First time on, on September 26, 1948. Okay, questions? So on the hallway there was a, a just kind of a description of the incident that happened here. Was that only one specific incident that happened that was a challenge with the robot, everything that they put in? Or did uh, they have more than one problem? I'm not sure which one you're talking about. That's a 1962 one. I think I saw that. Thing. Yeah, they had uh, some kind of issue. They didn't know which uh, tank would had overheated, so they had to send in a little kind of remotely operated camera. Ooh, you got me on that one. Oh. Well, there's a couple of Papers over there talking about. Oh, I'll have to go look. Uh -huh. Great question. Uh, whereabouts are the are the? Pictures? It's in the fan area. The exhaust, it is. The, the okay. Area. Okay. Yeah. I'll have to go find out. I'll uh -huh. try to get the answer, and I'll tell you on the way home. So, were there any significant incidents? Um, uh, in B reactor, no. It operated very efficiently, very effectively. Um, it did shut down the one time. Uh, if you when you leave this room, if you go back out this hallway and take an immediate left into what's known as the accumulator room. There's three tanks in there they are filled with rock, mm -hmm. literally filled with uh, river rock. And those tanks sit on um, a hydraulic pump, each one of them, and it, when, they're, when the reactor's operated, they're lifted to the ceiling and they're held in place by an electric clutch. And if the power is lost to the reactor, then those tanks fall and they pressurize the hydraulic system that pushes in seven of those hydraulic rods, uh, vertical control, or horizontal control rods. Um, with no interaction whatsoever by the operators. Mm -hmm. And we did have an instance where uh, power was lost to the reactor. I, uh, the Japanese used to build these uh, called Fugo balloons made out of paper that they would launch into the atmosphere and they'd get in the jet stream, flow across the Pacific, and they would strike uh, areas on, along the Pacific coast and even in, in as far inland as uh, Minnesota and Michigan. And one of those balloons, with a, they had explosive devices or uh, incendiary devices attached to the bottom of them. One of them struck a bottom of a power line, uh, cut the power off, and that we lost power to the reactor, so those tanks fell and pressurized the system and automatically shut the reactor down. That's crazy. Yeah. Other questions? Okay. If you, when you leave, we're, I think there'll be an announcement here pretty quick okay. about